are allowed to think big and dream big. How to generate different systems. Systems that provide stability and are nested within the harmony of nature. I'm excited to explore with you the intriguing bandwidth of information our researchers and friends have surfaced. Let's dive into our next topic to find out how we can actively shape a future worth pursuing and living for. Maya sits at a long wooden table in the kitchen. It's a spacious kitchen, as it's usually meant for cooking for about 20 people, roommates and guests alike. The cupboards are labeled with colorful tags indicating their contents, spices, pots, tablecloths, all to make it easy for newcomers to find what they need. They also have a digital inventory that can be accessed on everyone's devices but older individuals in particular insisted on having the labels. They were accustomed to them. On the table in front of Maya is a pot of tea. It is Maya's break before Maya wants to continue working. The sun is currently streaming through the windows, casting light on the room's interior and warming Maya's skin. However, Maya knows that there is a storm coming. They need to make everything stormproof, which is Maya's task for the day. Maya was born in the first half of the 21st century and thus is over 70 years old. Maya's parents couldn't find a suitable name, so they asked an artificial intelligence called ChatGTP. How should we name our child? Back then, a lot of people did that. Since new artificial intelligence evolved quickly, Maya never used ChatGPT, but everyone in Maya's generation learned how to use them. Nowadays, they help people with an unwanted task. Growing up, Maya lived in a formerly affluent country with a colonial past. During Maya's youth, they resided in an apartment in a major city. Passerby on the street could glance up and spot a young child gazing down at the traffic of countless cars for hours on end. However, after a few years, the city underwent a sudden change. Deep down, people knew it was coming, but they didn't act accordingly. Sea level had been rising for decades, and the old dam was constantly under reconstruction. It had to be elevated to enable the city's inhabitants to carry on with a busy life. Eventually, the construction couldn't keep up. A flood ensued, washing away some homes and burying others in mud. People demanded financial aid for reconstruction, but received very little. During the same year, different regions in the country suffered through droughts, water scarcity, heavy rainfall and floods. The government realized it would be a waste of money to rebuild a city so close to the sea. This decision changed a lot. The people were discontented. Previous affected areas had received compensation and now protests started. Initially, only a few individuals participated, but with time the protests grew both in size and intensity. Those who had lost their homes would work on rebuilding them in the mornings and join the protests in the evening. For years, the government had promised compensation for the losses and damages, taking out significant loans to manage the evolving crisis. A substantial portion of people's tax money had been invested in reconstructing other parts of the country. It wasn't fair that they were left alone now. Initially, the demand was for compensation, but it quickly shifted towards a call for a change in government. The current administration had taken in refugees from around the world and contributed to so-called International Solidarity Fund. Yet, where was the solidarity for them? The police attempted to manage the protest with a significant presence of officers in the city. Maya recalls a sea of police helmets underneath the window, running into a protest, beating people and yelling pepper spray on them. One woman laid on the street, her body parts trembling in unusual ways. Maya saw the wires connecting the stun gun and the policeman's hand to the woman's body. This picture stuck in Maya's head for years, until Maya realized what had happened there. 
Such instances of police brutality were sadly commonplace during this time. In an attempt to quell unwelcome protests, people had advocated for more restrictive police laws, enacting a right-wing government that prioritized internal security, which meant in reality to deal with symptoms rather than the actual problem. Actually, the government had long ceased providing robust support to refugees, even resorting to border control measures that occasionally involved shooting at people. Their contributions to the International Solidarity Fund had dwindled to a fraction of its initial promise. But no matter how ruthless they treated the rest of the world, those who had once elected them for these nationalist policies didn't care. Protests spread throughout the country, making it increasingly challenging for the police to maintain order. The government had expended considerable resources to conceal the dwindling public trust, leaving them ill-equipped to combat the climate crisis. But also, this last bit of trust vanished slowly. Several years passed, and then a more potent flood struck, obliterating everything that had been rebuilt in a matter of hours. People realized that the city held no future for them and left. Although they were refugees in their own country now, the lack of faith in politics led to the collapse of authorities, resulting in the absence of organized help. Maya remembers these times with horror, because especially the discrimination of women, LGBTIQ, people of color and other already marginalized people got worse. Somehow, for a lot of people, they were scapegoats for everybody's misery. Maya heard crude rumors why, but did not understand them. It was so much easier for nationalist and racist ideas to spread than for actual solutions. Maya believed the nationalist groups had won and were completely in charge soon. Maya, already in the 20s, also fled and went to a commune. Having been politically active in the climate justice movement, Maya aimed to bridge the gap between demands for local support for vulnerable populations and the call for global justice. While the country was relatively affluent, it had been built upon the oppression of other nations and contributed significantly to greenhouse gas emissions. It also oppressed a comparative degree of stability, allowing for better adaptation to the climate crisis fallout. Unfortunately, people didn't care about the climate justice movement. But that was about to change. Aware of the impeding challenges, the climate justice movement and other progressive groups had established a nationwide support network for refugees. Their focus was on meeting basic needs, toilets, food and shelter. However, the efforts extended beyond assistance. They shared knowledge on self-organization. With the collapse of the state system, they sought to establish a replacement that wouldn't be devolved into survival of the fittest. Teaching people to integrate diverse opinions into decision-making was essential to building resilient communities. This approach gained attraction as people recognized their interdependence within the community. An internal state support system was developed, linking various communities. If one community suffered losses due to the climate crisis effects, another community would provide assistance. Given the geographical separation, it was uncommon for both communities to experience the same natural disaster simultaneously. Life had transformed drastically from the past. Work patterns shifted since less goods were produced, and there was a bigger focus on the basic needs and on care work. Also, there was a lot of debates. Since money was worthless, they discussed how a fair economic system could look like and which digital innovations had overall positive impacts on their lives. Also rebuilding the energy system and actually supporting other countries were subjects of extensive discussion. Many meetings centered on processing the trauma of losing the stable world they once knew or addressing fears about an uncertain future. Despite this, Daily life maintained a semblance of familiarity. Children and young people received education, 
There were parties, friendships were nurtured, people went to work, took care of other people, cooked, slept, ate together, spent time on, at first a glance, pointless task and took time for regeneration. Decades passed, and as Maya age, the new social system became increasingly stable. Prioritizing human connections and interdependence reduced the need for excessive consumption. Owning only what was necessary and sharing resources beneficial to the community led to decreased resource consumption and nearly zero greenhouse gas emissions. This lifestyle ensured that planetary boundaries were not crossed. But it all happened too late. So the effects of the climate crisis were stronger than when Maya was young. Coping with extreme weather events had become a normal part of life. Large cities were no longer viable, as caring for such populations if a catastrophe happened became unmanageable. People still lived in smaller cities, but a lot also moved to the countryside to grow their own food. Even though it wasn't necessary, it gave them a feeling of confidence and autonomy. The number of both national and international refugees continued to rise. But with a significant portion of the population having once been refugees themselves, they readily welcomed newcomers or offered assistance for their journeys towards somewhere safe. Maya finishes the tea and stands up. The break was long enough and Maya feels rested again. Maya leaves the building and starts to move their bicycles into a shelter. Maya is still afraid of the future. The tipping points are scary since some are already triggered. Nonetheless, the current society has discovered a way to fulfilling life, probably even more fulfilling than when Maya was a child. Maya has a routine in making everything stormproof, while the rest of the community is still doing what they normally do on a sunny day. Maya acknowledges that each storm could yield significant consequences for the community, but there is comfort in the knowledge that support is available from friends and other communities. Early warning systems and buses are in place for efficient evacuations if necessary. This reassuring thought leads to a sense of security to everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you liked it. I tried to f make an utopia within the consequences of climate change because we know that the climate is changing and we know the consequences will be bad so hoping that everything is going to turn out well is not working at, at least for me. So in order to stay active against climate injustice, I need some kind of utopia that is still working within the climate change. Um, and this was some way of trying that and finding a utopia. And probably in a few weeks, it's going to look completely different. And maybe you didn't like it. And that's completely fine. I also realized that it's quite Eurocentric um, because this is my perspective on the world, of course, as a person from Germany. But maybe it helped you also to be a little bit more creative and thinking of an utopia that is worth fighting for and that is worth putting a lot of energy into changing the world so it is getting more climate just. Well, that's at least what I hoped. And I hope you like. Bye!